Hello and welcome to my review of The Trojan Horse by Hammond Eines. Eines was born in 1913 and wrote a handful of books prior to the outbreak of World War II, a handful more while serving in the military, and after being released from his military duties post-war became a full-time writer. While he wrote a smattering of children's books under the pseudonym Ralph Hammond, he is predominantly remembered for a string of thrillers based on research, extensive travel, and, where possible, personal experience. For example, Eins's obituary in the Times details how he lived and worked with Norwegian whalers while researching his 1948 novel, The Blue Ice. Eins's peers, Alistair MacLean and my own personal favourite, Desmond Bagley, are perhaps more well-remembered than he is in modern times. Now, I have a slight confession to make. I actually picked this up by accident, and I mean literally picked it up by accident. I was trying to decide between this book and The Killer Mine, the only two options in the bookshop for Hammond Irons. And after plumping for The Killer Mine, I got home to discover I'd picked the wrong one up. So we're not all perfect. Well, The Trojan Horse is not the story of a collapsed tin mine. It's the story of barrister Andrew Kilmartin, who is met in his office by Franz Schmidt, a man wanted for murder, who insists he is innocent and gives Kilmartin a few hints about how he can prove that he is. Kilmartin, against his original judgment, believes Schmidt and checks into his story. What he finds unravels a Nazi plot to steal a revolutionary British diesel engine and a conspiracy that goes to the heart of the wartime government. Kilmartin ropes in a friend, David, and Schmidt's daughter, Freya, who both disappear from the story for long periods. Kilmartin is a hero from another age of thriller writing. Though nominally an everyman out of his depth, we learn that he worked for intelligence in the First World War, and uh, he's very much in keeping with the Bagley and McLean heroes, in that he's from the age where men were men and were rarely seen out of a suit and tie, though they might deign to duck if someone was shooting at them. But feelings are for women. Getting stuff done is for men. As such, Kilmartin is resoundingly practical and methodical, and the only emotion he expresses is anger at the sadistic antagonist. I won't give his name away because the first section of the book, with Kilmartin following Schmidt's clues, is kind of a mystery, with Kilmartin searching for the man behind the conspiracy. Much of this involves little more than Kilmartin travelling around Britain talking to various people, but each clue leads to the next, and the conspiracy travels up the ladder of the men who run the city, the money, the government, and in and out of various gentlemen's clubs. None of this raises the pulse much, but as the stakes raise, so does the interest. The second half of the novel sees Kilmartin get too close to the mystery and then get abducted by the villains. He's a practical man, of course, and even a dungeon with no way out can't hold him. The ensuing chase is again interesting, but it's unlikely it'll have anyone flipping pages over fast enough to be in danger of a friction fire. By now I must have run more than a mile along that main sewer. I was almost dropping with fatigue and was rapidly losing the will to go on. I felt my capture was inevitable and I wanted to give in. At the same time, I was spurred automatically on by the fear that was in my heart. My torch was very dim now, but that no longer worried me. The sewer seemed a friendly place. Now, part of this lack of fear that Kilmartin is expressing is a comparison with an earlier section that disturbed him more, and I don't want to spoil that, but trying to heighten the fear of a return to that situation, Eins labours the lessening of the fear a little too much, and that's the sense that we actually end up taking away from the paragraph which in the middle of a chase scene isn't great. It's a shame because generally the second half of the book is pretty strong. The finale featuring a tank in an unusual circumstance demonstrates some more of the skills of these practical men. It's kind of fun, but even though it leads to some brief action from the Royal Navy and the RAF, it sticks firmly to the solid end of the solid spectacular spectrum. These are practical men, which Eines, with his own background, is much more home writing than the female characters. Kilmartin himself is almost put off by the small print of Schmidt's scheme, describing it as a melodrama, yet Eines, perhaps predictably, struggles with his female characters more, with Freya slipping into the melodrama herself at times. I can't bear it. I love him. He's all I've got. Oh, why should I have been given such a choice? Freya particularly offers little, being neither feisty enough to subvert the damsel in distress trope, or for most of the book, in actual enough peril to qualify for it. She is the love interest and little more, and her underuse, even in that role, might actually be a blessing when she's introduced like this. Though her figure was entrancingly neat and boyish, it was her head that inevitably held one's gaze. I think it was the finest head I'd ever seen on a woman. The face was oval to the point of a firm chin, and framed in black hair brushed sleek to the nape of her neck. The mouth was 
clearly moulded and full enough to give the promise of warmth. The nose was straight and small, with delicately chiselled nostrils, and the thin line of her eyebrows swept upwards over dark eyes to a high forehead. It was difficult to describe her and at the same time give any sense of the extreme perfection of those features. Difficult, no doubt, and probably best not to bother. Regardless, Freya attracts both David and Kilmartin, but causes no real friction between the two. And while Kilmartin considers himself too old for Freya, it's him that gets the date, even if neither of them gets the girl. In conclusion, Eins is much more at home writing about men than women. His love interest Freya barely registers, but his men investigate the seedy underbelly of London government and the wartime setting with enough aplomb to keep things moving. Nothing about Eins' prose will blow you away, but not much beyond perhaps the revolver with the silencer would actually ruin the story for you. Given the wartime setting and that this was published in 1941, there's a surprising lack of jingoism. The Nazi spy is unmasked and revealed to be an inferior specimen physically, and in contrast to his rational and pragmatic opponents, he's undone by his psychotic tendencies. If Eins leans a little too often on I don't know how we got out of that, his plot moves along reasonably well and ups the ante regularly until its imaginative conclusion. There's enough going on to recommend this if you're interested in these sort of thrillers. I may even check out some of Eins's later work myself, especially that Tin Mine book that I thought I was getting. As it stands, there are numerous efforts from the likes of McLean and Bagley that surpass this, but it remains a worthy entry to the action adventure genre. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one. Like and sub and all of that.